Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the Pixelcast. I am Jeremy Lessie, founder of Pixel Fest, and tonight I am joined by Matt Stranod. He is developer of RoboZaro. Matt was at Pixel Fest 2018, where I played this game, and he recently sort of caught back up with me, got in touch, and has delivered the game. It's on Steam. He gave me a Steam key, and I got the, uh, the pleasure to actually play the game. And we're going to talk about a bunch of just indie developer-related stuff. So how's it going tonight, Matt? Yeah, absolutely, man. It's uh, it's an absolute pleasure. And now, if I remember correctly from Pixel Fest, and this is this is going back a ways, I know we didn't spend a whole lot of time together, but you are developing this game here local in Hampton Roads. That's correct, right? Yeah, I live in Norfolk. Yeah. Awesome. And were you from originally from like Maryland, or you had recently moved here? Yeah, I, did. I recently moved from Los Angeles. Oh, from Los Angeles. Okay, awesome. I, yeah, I, I kind of remember that. I know we I only, only spent a few minutes together, but I, I kind of remember it's like, okay, this guy had this really well polished game, recently moved to Hampton Roads, and I knew I knew you were from out of town. I couldn't remember what city you were from. So Los Angeles, that's really cool. Um, yeah, yeah. Now, and what brought you to, to Hampton Roads or to, to Norfolk, which is really cool? You're right here. Yeah, my my wife got a really awesome job opportunity, and so we hopped on it. And uh, when we hopped on it, we weren't sure what I was going to do job wise, but she basically said, my job that, you know, that I have out in Norfolk is pretty awesome, and if you want to take a stab at being a full-time game developer, I support you in doing that, so that, that's what brought us out here, and that's, uh, that's how this little game got made. That is such a wonderful story. I'm so glad to hear that. And uh, the game, of course, you guys can see in the background. Now, I'm trying something a little different because I've had, as I was just telling Matt, a couple of developers come along and say, hey, can you like kind of play my game? And I'm like, well, it's not really necessarily that type of show, but I'm always looking to try to see, you know, what new experiments we can run while we're doing the show. And tonight, RoboZar is running in the background, and that's running over Skype from another computer. So the game is a, is a, is a PC-based game, and I record the Pixelcast on a MacBook. So I've got this thing streaming over from the uh, the PC, and you can see I'm going to look over here for a second, and you know it's uh it's actually it's it's reasonable when the uh, the screen changes, uh, you can actually sort of play this and you can see what's going on. So and the good thing about this game, I I think is that the uh, the action can be a little fast paced, but I think it's not too fast paced to actually do this, at least not to to sort of run around for a second and show you all the uh, the gameplay, which is really cool. This game is. Um, I'm I'm sort of down in the sewers right now, and my but I have to tell you, Matt. Oh, I sort of paused it there, which is in a school. Um, I have to tell you, I was extremely impressed by the opening of this game. I think you put a phenomenal level of detail. Um, it's sort of like once you get outside of Graham's house and you get into the city there, and it's raining, and you know there's all sorts of like flying cars going on in the background, and um, the game just sort of oozes personality. Which I'm trying to think of the last time that I saw a game I think with that with the degree of personality that's going on in the background there but it definitely uh, and it reminds me kind of of the I don't know like the Super Nintendo era um, you know but even more it's 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 there's so much detail that you put into it so it's really I think really impressive that opening scene especially so yeah thank you yeah I put a lot of time in the opening to for that very reason to try to get people to go wow uh, you know somebody cared about this game <laughs> oh man it just something that got out yeah, I'm glad you noticed. it uh, really was incredible. I mean, I, I I was even getting in when I got over to the um, I've, the name of the shop escapes me, but the fix it uh, when you go visit Fix. Yeah, Fix and Chips. So yes, when you go into Fix and Chips, uh, you know, I was like bumping into the signs, and I noticed that they were all physics enabled, and like it really looked like I was bumping into a sign, and you easily, you know. Somebody easily could have just like made that sign part of the background, like you couldn't interact with it. But you know, you went and and added that extra le level of detail where it's like, oh, not only, you know, does it, is is the art well done and everything like that, but now I've got this extra layer of interactivity. I don't know if it actually suits a purpose yet. You know, for for my part, I was just like, oh, somebody, you know, like Matt took the time to make this stuff. So when I jump into it, it's interactive. Um, so it's like not only is there a tremendous degree of you know personality and depth and you know, richness to the world, like I, you, and it really brings you in the story as well. Um, I don't know what's going on yet. I don't know the story of this game. It's it um, it has me on the edge of my seat a little bit though because there's there's a little bit of mystery to it. 
I guess you could say like I'm like well, what am I what am I doing here exactly but I don't know what I'm doing and I guess I'm, it's gonna all unfold as I'm playing the game so yeah it, it unfolds there's a there's a couple points in the game where you get kind of like a big exposition dump from a couple of characters in regards to the the plot there there is a pretty thick plot I, I've actually spent the uh, the past couple of days fleshing out the uh, the lore and stuff like that in case I do a potential sequel I just wanted to have a, a better idea what the what the game world is about right. Um, yeah, in regards to like the, uh, the the sign in the shop having physics and stuff like that, from a game development standpoint, it was sort of an, an experiment that I kept into the game when I was trying to teach myself, you know, how to program and how to use a game engine. And I realized I could do physics ropes and, and things like that. It started off with me, you know, attaching ropes to a rectangle and then putting, you know, the the lighting on it and then seeing like okay so so i'm bumping into the sign and it's swinging how do i get the lighting to actually stay with the physics movement and i thought it looked pretty cool so i just kind of left it in but yeah some things are happy accidents like that yeah that was i think that's certainly one of them then um really it really added a lot of depth to it so now you showed this off at pixel fest 2018 that's where we first met uh, as far as i know as far as i can remember and i do remember playing it um there was Definitely a slightly different mechanic when I played it in, in at Pixel Fest 2018. I think that's what I remember. I almost remember like, and I, maybe I was just getting it confused with another game that I played like right around the same time. I know I sort of came by. I try to come by the indie like showcase or um, you know where people are demoing their games and, and try to play them all. Um, but I remember there being like a, a sort of either up and down type or squat mechanic. I'm trying to remember what the mechanic was. And maybe I, I was actually playing, you, you mentioned there's a gravity mechanic in the game, and maybe I'd actually played that um, at the time. I can't I can't remember. I remember there being some mechanic to it and just being like, that is, that's really neat. Um, and, and again... You, yeah, besides the, uh, the, the gravity gun, you might be thinking of like the, the rope arm. The, because the, the sewers area is kind of like the intro area, so I tried to get like the, the two core weapons slash gadgets to the player early on. One of them is a like a grappling hook that lets you lash onto the ceiling and, and swing around as much as you want. It right. might have been that. Yeah. The other thing it could have been is I know that like two booths down from me at Pixel Fest, there was another dev team there with a they also had some sort of a robot game. I, I didn't get to play it, but okay. maybe was there a robot game? It, it could have been. I, I could have mixed up the mechanics in my head. I think the one thing I do remember about this game was the level of polish, even then. So, how long have you been working on this game? This game, uh, what you're playing right now, took about two years. Two years, okay. So, but, you had, you had but, just started then. Uh, you know, or you maybe were like six months in when, when Pixel Fest 2018 happened? Yeah, when, when Pixel Fest was in, I had the sewer area that you're playing started the second area of the game and there's there's five areas total so I did a lot of work after that keep, keep in mind though like two years was it was me you know going from writing my first line of code I had never drawn pixel art before I had never used a game engine before so right. I had to go from like knowing nothing about game development to making a game so I mean for someone else to produce a similar quality of work maybe it wouldn't take as long but it took me two years you know oh yeah no it it, it feels like um, you yeah, know the interesting thing I Actually, I'm kind of confused here. Am I supposed to jump across this? So I have the developer on on the uh, on the line here. If I jump into this green stuff, am I going to burn up? Not instantly, but you will take damage. Yeah, this part's a little bit mean. It's it's kind of like a really hard platforming part. Okay, I was like, I I looked at that platform and I was like, I don't think I can actually make that even with a double jump. Oh, come on, buddy. Oh, I got it. You know what? Do it. It's just hard to build the momentum. Do I have to put my trigger on the other? So with those guys, too, if you shoot their base. Destroy them in fewer hits. Ah. Uh, like the turrets are kind of like sensitive. There's like a top and a bottom. The top takes more damage than the bottom. Nice. All right. I'm getting pro tips here as I play. Hey, this yeah, is definitely yeah. the way to play the game. <laughs> oh, make it! Oh, I did it. Yeah, so you can do it. <laughs> oh, gosh, I keep hitting. So uh, everybody, whoa! Oh no! 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 One of, one of the fun things I do too is after you beat the, the story in the game unlock the time trials mode so if you load in here in time trials mode later you'll actually you'll have the grappling arm you'll have a jetpack and so you can go through these areas but not even have to touch the slime if you don't want right. to you'll have all the weapons and stuff so certain things that were hard the first time through the game get really easy so one thing i'm noticing i 
Matt and I were talking earlier about games that are sort of dual analog based with jump and shoot mechanics and with swap fire we have a similar similar thing and a lot of people were like you know it's weird the game is bumper heavy uh, people would say that um, because we made it so that the bumpers jump and shoot and this game has a similar feel where you need you need to use the dual analog stick almost all the time and so you don't really want to take your thumb off the analog stick in order to jump and that was uh, that was definitely a swap fire issue but I just I was just noticing that I had it set so that I would jump with the right bumper but I would shoot with the left trigger on an Xbox, I'm, I got an Xbox 360 pad that you can't see because of the green screen um, but I noticed that I was my go-to I was always trying to go hit the right trigger to jump so I just had to reconfigure that real fast make it oh Matt I am definitely playing this better with a 360 pad than than with a mouse but I was using a laptop and I was just using the trackpad before I don't have an actual mouse for it so I think that's probably why I'm playing better with this because I could totally see this being like a uh, oh I missed that I could totally see this being very playable with a uh, WASD like straight up mouse Sort of like a 2D shooter. It is a 2D yeah, I shooter. Yeah, the, the aiming is easier with the mouse. You know, because you can just point wherever you want to shoot to. So. Yeah. Yeah, oh, man. I'm actually... It's, this is really cool. I um, I know you didn't want to spend the whole time talking about the game, but it's a really cool game. So anybody... And, and this game is available for people to purchase on Steam, like, right now, right? Like, anybody go to Steam and buy this? Yeah, it's five bucks on Steam. Five bucks? Man, that's a bargain, okay? <laughs> go, go buy Rovozaro. It's really fun. Uh, Matt's put, I think, a tremendous amount into the story and, I mean, and, you know, the graphics, all the detail he put into it. And, then, and so this is then your first game that you've shipped. Yeah, yeah, it's my first game. That is very cool. Now, what was your profession? Like, were you a software developer before? You said your first line of code, right? So, like, you had never touched game development, and I'm assuming you were not a software developer of any type before this. Um, no. So I did audio video for a theme park in the LA area, and then I also did audio video for uh, for hotels and like corporate presentations and stuff like nice. that. Nice. Okay. But, like on the side, my hobby was always music production. You know, specifically on like a laptop, just kind of like you know, writing music and logic on Mac and producing and you know putting out like electronic music and stuff. So I had that. Very I had that very cool. Guess. Yeah. Well, that I, I, I think that. That definitely gets you part of the way there with game development. I mean, you're used to dealing with you know the technical difficulties that go along with that type of setup. There's always some sort of tech issue and whatnot. I mean, yes, moving from that to game development, it's probably an, sort of like an order of magnitude uh, difference uh, on, on that. But it seems to it seems to be you know a logical a logical step. But this is definitely very very cool for your first game, and I think this should also inspire other people that might be watching this to recognize that you can put together a really polished product and um, you know you can you can do that your first time out in, in fact I notice sometimes on people's first time out they approach it with more passion than other times and um, something I, I hope I know before you were saying maybe the sales on Steam weren't uh, so great just yet I hope you don't get discouraged though because there's a tremendous amount of promise uh, in, in what you've done here and I think that might be the one thing is game development is so hard and when you put all that love into a product, if it doesn't work out, you can spend a lot of time trying to figure out why it didn't work. And in my experience, I had that I had that experience with the first game that I got published. And that were and for me, there were a couple of games that I made trying to get published before I got published that, that very first time. Um, I I found myself going sort of into a tailspin trying to figure out what went wrong because I I couldn't understand why the game wasn't a success, at least to some degree, you know. And, you know, it's just funny. The, game, the first game for me that really was kind of a success, I didn't work on nearly as hard. It just happened to be the right fit for the market at the right time. And it was, yeah. it was sort of around that time that I started feeling like, oh, I, I kind of get this, that you can put, you know, a lot of magnitude behind a game. But especially for indies, a lot of the value is in the direction that you take uh, with the game. And that direction just has to sort of feed into the great, you know, ether of, of the universe at that time, or however you want to put it. If it's the right fit, if it's the right direction, and that's what people are looking for, then 
it can be a massive hit without having you know some tremendous amount of magnitude behind the game but that is a lesson that was learned over a long period of time uh, you know for me personally and uh, still I mean I don't I don't have that by anywhere any any means is that mastered and the other thing that I would I would have to say about that is that is also a it's kind of a flippant or I'm trying to think it, there's almost like a butterfly in a wind effect to that strategy also you could you because you could make a lot of different games in a lot of different directions trying to catch you know sort of trying to catch a wave uh, at random almost you know that it's not obviously it's not random but I do think there's something to be said for sticking with one IP and just doing things associated with that IP over a long haul and I think eventually making that something that's successful and something that's popular and so even if you come out first time and you know it doesn't hit like you you hope that it would hit especially for the amount of work that you put in you know continuing to you know get get people engaged with the IP whether it you know whether it be you know a contest or whether it be you know um, you know fan art I'm trying to think of all the different things that people do and yeah. I think over the long haul you might actually have more success with that just by sticking with your IP you know being like you know what I love this and just stick with it that's that's more how I personally I'm approaching swap fire at this point I've decided that I'm not really I don't think I want to just go make a game because I've got um, I've got an interest in a mechanic I think I want to make I think I want to build an IP and when you're building an IP I think there's a long haul aspect to that you have to love what you're working on and you just have to stick with it um, so I'm, I'm not sure how you're feeling about RoboZaro at this point but obviously put a lot of love into it and it does seem like the type of thing where you could build, you know, you could just keep kind of building on this IP. It seems deep enough to where you could just yeah, keep, yeah. you know, keep building on this and, you know. I hear you. No, thank you. Yeah, it makes, everything you said makes total sense, too. I definitely believe in it. I, I went through the process of trademarking the, the name and everything like that, so I do want to keep going with it with it in the future and stuff like that and the uh like the, the steam release and kind of knowing that i had like a, a little bit of momentum on twitter a little bit of momentum on facebook i, I could tell based on that little bit of momentum that the sales weren't going to be stellar but at the same time even before i launched on pc i got a, approached by a publisher about doing the the console versions of the game so even though the PC version didn't do that good, I was told that the console market is different enough to the point where this game could have its first solid shot. We're working on the uh, the PS4, Xbox One, and Switch versions of it right now. Very nice. Um, try, trying to get it out a little bit later this year, so I, I'm crossing my fingers that it, it does a little bit over, a little bit better, like on the on the consoles. But even that, even if for some reason it doesn't, and like I, I hope I hope that it does well, you know. If not just for my sake, but for the sake of the publisher taking a stab at this right. new weird weird game, also, um, you're right. It, it was it was making the game was an experience, and it's one I wouldn't trade for anything. It's one of the hardest things that I've ever tried to do. And so, to answer your question, no, I, I don't feel down about it at all. Even if even if I sell one copy on PS4 and one copy on Switch, like I still I don't know. <laughs> Making games is just so awesome, and it's something to be proud of when you right. when you can actually ship a product, right? Well, that 100. You know, Vince White was on the show a couple weeks ago, and he he said that same thing. He said, you know, it's a success if you bring a pro, you know, a product to market. So I'm like totally getting into the game here. Um, <laughs> I'm up sooner. So um, now I think it's a really cool story though that you shipped it on Steam yourself, and a publisher found it on Steam and then approached you. development about a year total i streamed on twitch every day for anywhere between like two to two to five hours daily and even though i didn't even though i didn't get approached like on twitch during a stream or anything like that it was actually somebody who came into one of my streams a couple of times um who approached me after the fact and when, when they came into my streams and they said hi to me and they were asking me questions about the game and stuff like that i had no idea that that it was somebody who uh, had a relationship with a publisher and could make things like this happen. So it was kind of a like a lightning in the bottle, quote unquote, who you know kind of scenario. Oh, except wow. I didn't know who I knew, you know? Right. You're just sitting there making your game. 
Yeah, exactly. You're you were being passionate about what you love, you know, you, and they could right. I they could probably tell that you loved your game from doing that. You know, I actually I think that's a really great idea to stream your development because that allows people to see really in a very transparent fashion how much you're putting into the game. Whereas yeah. normally if they just play this game and they don't know anything about development, you know, I mean they're just like, you know, they they have nothing to go on to see what you're putting into it, you know. start streaming development on, on Twitch and she said why and I said I was having a panic attack about making this game and nobody knowing about it right. <laughs> like just like putting something out there you know and it potentially being cool which is kind of what happened I guess some people tell me that they like the game and and nobody knowing that it exists which is kind of where it's at on Steam right now admittedly is for the most part people seem to like it once they get used to it but mm -hmm. compared to the amount of people that have you know uh, a Steam accounts and whatnot about it. So, right. You know, I was trying to prevent that. Discovery is very, very difficult. And in today's market, what I've noticed over the past, well, if you if you look at it over the past like 12 years, uh, now I've been developing indie games since 2001 or, two, well, yeah, longer than that really, but the first published game that I made was Aerial Antics, which got published by Garage Games and we published it independently in 2003, and I think Garage Games published it in like January of 2004 or something like that. But at that point, indie games were, you know, it was, it was a relatively new term. I'm actually going to have Jay Moore on the show who was at Garage Games at the time, and he he's, he's going to tell the story about how he almost trademarked the term indie game. They that they could have they could have trademarked that term. Now the rest of the guys, the guys who are like the founders of Garage Games, were like, no, that's evil. We're not doing that. Um, but the term indie game really came out of what these guys were doing. And Interesting. yeah, but it was sort of before indie games really boomed, right? So you had like indie game the movie, like years later, like when indie game the movie came out, they were like, oh, these there's a movie about what you do now, and I was like, yeah, okay. <laughs> years did, did years did later. Did the name? Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Go on. Oh no, you're fine. I, I was gonna say, did the did the term indie game eventually get trademarked or? No, no, it's just sort of they public. They just they just let it go. They could have trademarked it at the time because it was such a new concept and nobody was really doing it. And Garage Games had created this whole business model around indie games, yeah. so they were like, oh, we, you know. Uh, Jay Moore had actually like looked into it and was like that term could be trademarked and you know they all decided they all decided collectively not to do it but and I'm gonna have to bring that up it was a, it was a pretty interesting story that he told me but yeah, I, uh, I wasn't sure if somebody swooped in and trademarked it after the fact like when the movie came out or something like oh. that if they got screwed over they might have a trademark uh, within the domain of movies for the title yeah. that, that that's conceivable um, the thing is it seemed like the indie market didn't really start booming until 2008, 2009, that's when all of a sudden the iPhone came around and indies were able to de develop you know, pretty cheap and get a lot of bang for their buck as far as discovery goes. Because with the App Store at first, I remember using the App Store to the point where I could look at every app on the store. I mean, in the summer of 2008, there were less than a thousand apps. I was on a car trip, I was on a road trip where I wasn't driving for once. And I literally looked at every app on the store in 2008, yeah. and I was making my decision as to whether I was going to make a game uh, for the new Xbox indie platform. Not not Xbox Live Arcade, but they actually came out with an indie one afterward. And I looked at both of those platforms, and I was like, well, am I going to make a game for that? And I was prototyping something with the uh, that dev kit that they had where you could hook your PC to your Xbox. And then I was like, I was looking at iPhone, and I thought, man, I'm going to go for iPhone. I think this is where it's going to be. Um, I actually wrote the first iPhone like game development article for Gama Sutra uh, like way back in the day, and the editors there at the time they were like, "We're not sure iPhone's going to be a thing. We don't know if we even want to publish this article," you know. And of course, iPhone probably ended up being like the biggest thing to happen to indies. And the first games that I actually made like a living off of were my iPhone games. You know, I made these iPhone games, and before I knew it, I'm making a full living just off off of iPhone games. Then you know That's the indie. Amazing. Oh, go ahead. I said that's amazing. Yeah, it was. Oh man, it was such a rush, especially after working on games for so long. And finally, you know, you know, finding a way. But yeah. I guess the point of it, I was going to say, you know, the indie apocalypse happened, you know, circa 2012 or 13, which is what 
directed me sort of, I don't want to say away from games because I'm still involved in games, but it made me start wanting to look at other things because I knew that Apple was changing the store. But between 2008, 9 and 2012, maybe 13, a little bit, there was this really great window of opportunity where there were the discovery aspect for your indie games was very easy and there wasn't a lot of content yet so discovery wasn't like a real problem I and mean, people talked about it as being a problem and obviously some people's games got buried but as an indie without a lot of money i found the discovery to be phenomenal compared to anything that came before that um, once apple redesigned the store it sort of took that away now steam was getting rolling at like the same time uh with the steam green light i mean steam was already a thing but i think green light came around in 2012 so I was looking to maybe do Steam Greenlight at that sort of junction, and that's really when I ended up getting into what is now Stream SDK. So, which I know that you were you had seen, um, and I sort of I sort of veered off a little bit, still in the in the gaming world, but veered off a little bit from the entertainment side into the utilitarian side. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. So now in this scene, how do I get? How do I get? How do I? Uh, beat this guy. Do I beat him? Or do I just go past him? No, you beat him. You gotta get the, the battery to open the door. And actually, that's a bug. Ah! <laughs> it's, it's, it's hard, the turret floating against the wall there is a, is a bug. The, the easiest way to, to destroy this guy is w one of two ways. You can shoot the ceiling spikes down. Ah, oh wait. Instead, and they'll do big damage to him. Nice. Or, if you can get him to spawn his turrets... He'll run into them and they will damage him. I just noticed that actually when I when he he did run into a turret and do, 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 do. woo that's awesome man I didn't think about that see even that there's just so much you know even to set something like that up so much detail uh, I feel like went into this <laughs> and you unlocked an achievement <laughs> sweet. Let's see here. Here's the good old professor. Oh, see, I should have read that. Yeah. I didn't read that first. I, th I got. I was like, oh, there's enemies in here. I'll, I'll shoot the enemies first, and then I'll read what he's gonna say. Now, to everybody at home that's watching this, the game runs a lot smoother than this. It's all because of Skype. <laughs> yeah. Is, is it running a silky smooth for you? It's yeah. It's it's you know it's 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 completely it's completely smooth for me. So yeah, the, you know, with Skype you're getting you know five frames per second or less, uh, and no, no, no. <clears throat> but yeah, that's um for me that was the point at which I moved over. Now I did make a few games, obviously, after that point of switching over to looking at utilitarian things, um, and I'm trying to think if I made anything really successful. I made the last game that I made that I consider to be really successful was Airspin. And so I shipped that game in 2012. That was the last like million plus download game that I made. Oh man, I didn't know that you were doing numbers like that. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. We had, um, I think with, on iOS I have over 10 million downloads to my name on, on iOS. So, but you know, it's all during that period before the Indiepocalypse. So, you know, now when you look at the numbers now, you're like, man, you know, you're happy if you get trying to think you get a few thousand people or something and you're stoked you know but um in in, in that time period that i mean it, you could do that you could do it or i had a game called crash for cash that organically became the number one app and it just it just organically rose to the top and it was you know that was the first the, the sort of first hit game that i you know I, that i made so and that game you know has many millions of downloads and then Airspin was the second one that I did that had an excess of a million. And I had a couple of other games that were, you know, in the half a million range, give or take. Um, yeah, it was a special, I think it was definitely a special time to be, you know, doing indie games. And now it seems to be, you know, more of the long tail thing. You're not getting as much exposure for free as you were during that time period. You know, they were, they were trying, that was, one, one thing I talk about on the show a lot is there's like a kingmaker phase to new platforms. And... So with Facebook, with Twitter, with the App Store, with all these platforms that came in sort of the, let's say the 2005 to 2015 range, everything in there, it seemed like they wanted to grow. They were, all those companies were looking for growth over profits. 
And so yeah. what they what they did was they made it sort of disproportionately valuable to get in early and they would they would do like a kingmaker phase and they would let you know they would sort of scale up people that would become examples as why you should use this platform so of course uh, somebody that got in on the app store early right yeah. on hey i'm having all the success with the app store you should do it too now everybody starts getting the app store everybody's talking about the app store so those first people that got in they they sort of succeeded i think at a very disproportionate level because apple was trying to scale this thing up once it reached a certain point, they changed all the mechanics of the store and all that free discovery went away. Now, they, they, who knows, they could have changed that. That might not have been on purpose. They might have just changed it because they couldn't deal with the way the volume was coming in. Because, I mean, one of the things that happened due to the, the mechanics of the store, of course, was that you would submit your game and it would go to the top of the new list. When you're at the top of the new list, everybody saw your game and so you'd get all this attention. Well, after a week, you know, nobody could see your game anymore. If you resubmitted the game to Apple with an update, they would put it back to the top of the new list. So what you would get is this infinite cycle of just, you know, sending an update to your game. And you might not hardly do anything to the game, but an update nevertheless would put you back to the top of the new list. It seems like that mechanic, though, was something that was unsustainable for Apple. And so they knew they had to change the mechanics of the store and they completely then started to dissuade developers from doing that. Um, and they eventually structured the store in such a way that um, I think discovery in general is very hard. Like you almost have to, the only way to get people to your game is to advertise through an ad network or to, you know, for people to already know what it is, you know, get that sort of word of mouth thing going or you know, obviously to hook it in some sort of social way, um, you yeah. know, where you're posting on social media about it or, you know, giving rewards for that type of stuff. Then I mean, there was all kinds of mechanics that came afterwards to try to get discovery up. But um, when I had those games, I remember though, what people were talking about was spending an upwards of a hundred thousand dollars a day in advertising revenue to keep these games in the in the sort of the top fifty, top one hundred. Oh hmm. I guess it was paying off though. It was you know, or else they wouldn't have done it, right? Oh yeah, or I think they were definitely making their money. Um, oh so when I did Crash for Cash, that game was organic. That just went to the top by itself, and it was sort of pre. When I, I think when I first put the game out, it was all, it wasn't pre ad networks. But it was it was in very early days of ad networks. I can say this: when 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 Crash for Cash was number one, and it was a free game, but I had I had used AdMob. AdMob didn't have enough fill, like ad fill, to give me enough ads for all the traffic the game was getting. So they had to start cutting my fill rate, which was uh, bad because you couldn't make as much money then. <laughs> so they would they would stop serving ads because the game was eating up too much of the uh, the network bandwidth. Which was pretty crazy, um, but the, go ahead. I was gonna say the uh, the games that you were putting out on uh, on iOS back in the day and stuff like that. Were you doing microtransactions and stuff like that, or were you doing a you know like a one time just buy the game regular type of system? So when and, I started, uh, it was just paid games. So the first game that I put out was Debris. Actually, I was watching Detonators, the Detonators, the other day, which is a TV show about you know uh, controlled demolition of buildings. And uh, I have to take I have to take credit for this. I invented that genre, <laughs> the controlled demolition <laughs> genre. So the first game I put out was this game called Debris. And it was it was a really poor execution on the concept. And somebody came along a few months later with a game called Implode. That was much better execution on that concept. And that actually became the number one game on the store for a while. So I think a lot of people will probably probably remember Implode, but I don't think a lot of people will remember Debris. But Debris was a 99 cent game where you know, you put bombs on the buildings and hit the plunger, blow the building up. Um, that's what actually, that, that whole game is what guided me towards using Unity and guided me towards the iPhone and everything like that. That was the game I was looking to prototype on a number, I prototyped it already on a number of different platforms and engines and stuff. But yeah, it was a 99 cent game. And then um, I did a game called Cosmosis, one called Skyline Blade, one called Disco Pool, and all those games were paid because it was before in-app purchases. So, oh, okay. yeah, in-app purchases didn't start until like June or July of 2009. It was the summer of 2009, and I'm trying to think how long it took me to make an IAP game. So the whole store though was just paid apps, and at first people were charging, you know, ten bucks, fifteen bucks. They were they were trying to do that, and then somebody discovered, well, if you just drop the price to 99 cents, more people buy it, the game goes right up to the top of the charts, and then you have all the visibility in the world, so you were disproportionately rewarded for making your game 99 cents. 
due to the, the nature of the structure of the charts, you know, because it was all, I guess prior to this in retail, you had limited shelf space, so whatever was selling yeah. would be given the shelf space. Um, you know, in this case, the shelf space became the top of the charts. I still see that happening on the Nintendo eShop. I don't know, week in and week out, you'll see a game that's on sale for 97% off, and yep. it's like a quarter or it's a buck, and it's in the, the most popular section as well Yep. because of that. Yeah, yep. you get this disproportionate return for racing to the bottom to drop your price down. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's, I mean, it's an advertising, it's a way to get your game out there and get it, get it noticed more. Um, yep. We did that with with Swapfire. We ended up making it free for a while to um, to get attention for that game on the Nintendo Wii U when we did that, and it ended up being yeah. We were the uh, when Breath of the Wild launched, we were the number two game. So we never got we didn't get number one when Zelda was new. Later on, eventually, we got number one a couple of times on the store by doing by dropping the price and using that mechanic. Um, you know, dropping it to, to free and just giving it away. And we dropped the price to 99 cents uh, when it used to be 15 bucks a couple times, and it rose up the charts. It never became, never went all the way to the top. It would only go all the way to the top if we made it free. Uh, now the game is just 99 cents all the time on the on the Wii U. Is a, I don't know if it's too personal of a question, but when you answer it, if you can, when you when you initially price a game at 15 dollars, and then you do the thing where you sell it for 99 cents for a certain amount of time, do you? Like, is, is it worth it, just selling it for a buck to, you know, maybe like 30 people instead of just a couple people? Like, does it does it make up for itself when you do that? I would say that with Swapfire, really what it became was the realization that this game is not going to be financially successful. Mm. And so we have to do whatever it takes to get people to know what the IP is. Okay. Since uh, I realized that this game is not going to be financially successful, you know, I put all the work into it, years of work and whatnot, but it's just not going. It's just not going to happen. So at that point, you're like, you know what? I just want to get people across this line. There's this line, and there's people that don't know what it is, and then there's people that do know what it is. Now, once you get them to cross the line, they're going to decide whether they like it or don't like it. And I guess you want to get them over the line, saying so know what it is. They play it, and then they decide if they like it or don't like it, and hopefully. The number of people that like it on the other side of that line is enough so that when you finally finally deliver a sequel, uh, you know they will buy it. And you know our reviews were not bad on Swapfire, so it seemed like uh, I was trying to take a guess. Looking at just our four and five star reviews, which you assume if you're getting a four and five star review that that's somebody that's probably going to buy the game next time, and if you have a three star or lower, that's probably somebody that's not going to buy the game next time. Okay. Um, so, you know, four and five star review, that's a favorable review. So looking at our four and five star reviews, I, it, you know, it, it figured to me that a relatively high percentage of people were giving it those reviews. And so I could expect hopefully them to buy a sequel to this game. And I decided I was going to take that sort of long, long tail view and just like keep developing that IP, not jump around with a lot of different games, just going to focus on that. And so every person that we could get into that camp was going to be tremendously valuable in the future. Have you, um, have you ever, pr you, you mentioned brief, I don't know if I can talk about this, I, I don't know, I don't know what is a secret, secret with Swapfire and what isn't, I think you mentioned when you were looking at this game, of like, oh, Swapfire in 2D, it could work, I'm not sure, is that something you have prototyped or not, because picturing the gameplay of Swapfire, which I, I've never played the game, but I looked up YouTube videos of it and stuff like that, and mm -hmm. it looked real wild, especially when I saw people, like, jumping off of ledges, shooting somebody else, and yeah. swapping places, so you fall down, it was so, it's so cool, when, I don't know, it had to have been cool for you when people were figuring that stuff out, but that gameplay mechanic in 2D, especially with couch co-op, could be a riot, man, it could be awesome. Yeah, I really want to do it, I, um, I did, I, you know what I prototyped it in? <laughs> I did prototype it very quickly in Unity, but you know what I really, I, the, be, the better prototype? I used huh. I used Fuse for the Nintendo Switch. Have you played that? Played around with that? No, no. So Is it's it a, a, just like a 2D tinkering around, like a, like a game where you can make games, that sort of thing? Yeah, it's an app for the Nintendo Switch. You can actually hook okay. a USB keyboard up to your Switch, and you can actually oh. write code in, inside of Fuse. It's got like a, what do they call it, like a Python basic C hybrid language. And mm -hmm. so you can write code, and I'll write on your Switch, and compile it, and, and play games, and it, they've got a bunch of assets in there that you can use. It has a sprite editor. I 
think it had, I'm trying to remember if it had an audio editor. Like that I can't remember. I know it had a sprite editor. I think it might have had some type of audio editor. Um, if not, it had a bunch of sound effects and stuff. So I actually was able to play a sort of two-dimensional prototype there. I think the one thing that would have to be a little different is in the Wii U game, it had this constant beam that you would shoot. And if the beam just intersected anything, you would swap with it. And um, Vince White, he, he actually came up with the idea. He was like, what if you, what if you actually switched it so that it was more of a pulse type weapon and as you hit people, it charges up and it doesn't swap instantly. You know, you have to hit them three, four, five times before it instantiates the swap. Oh, and, that's uh, cool, like you earn it. Yeah, you kind of have to stay on them to get it, you know? And um, yeah. that, I think, if you cross those two ideas, I think it could work really well in, uh, in 2D. So that's... I, I, I don't know, I'm kind, of, I'm kind of leaning in that direction just because, I'm, and I mean, I've tried to, I'll be completely transparent with this stuff, um, you know, ran a Kickstarter in 2017, it was successful, the point of the Kickstarter was to get 757 Angels on board with the game, we sort of like, we took the game to them, we're like, hey, made this game, you know, took forever, we invested, you know, I mean, basically somewhere on the order of a quarter million to $300,000 developing this game, um, we got it out on the Switch. I mean, on the Wii U. Sorry, not the Switch. Not on the Switch yet. We got it out on the Wii U. We were able to promote it. You know, we got you know we got magazine articles and we got a lot of good press. Um, so we were able to successfully promote it. We were able to get it into the number two slot on the store under Breath of the Wild, which is you know the the biggest game launch uh, of the system basically. Um, you know, and at the time it was like the highest rated game of all time. So you know, we we sort of felt like we had proven that we can. You know, obviously we can technically execute this, uh, you know, we can get attention for ourselves, we can, you know, market the game that just obviously people that are interested in it, we, we weren't able to like take it all the way as far as making it like a real financial success, but uh, it seemed to show promise. They took a look at it, we're like, yeah, yes, this looks pretty good. Why don't you go get some more market validation, get some more cash, you know, like show that people are going to buy this. So we did the Kickstarter and obviously we were able to, we did a two week Kickstarter too, it was like super short. I wasn't trying to raise the money to make the game off of Kickstarter. I was just trying to prove to 757 Angels that we had an audience out there that was willing to put cash down on this product like sight unseen, you know. Um, Kickstarter was successful, went back to the Angels. They sort of took it up to their highest levels at this point. Like we, you know, they were like, all right, great, you did it. Uh, but they, they came back and were like, we're just not comfortable yet. It's just not, it's not sh a short enough thing for us to basically take it to our investors. Um, and so then after that, I looked for, you know, other people that I knew that could be investors and nothing really panned out. Then I thought, okay, well, let me, um, I, 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 I co-founded Because, do you know, do you know Because? No. The, uh, so the, the largest Bitcoin mine in the, in the, in North America anyway, for a little while was the Bitcoin mining facility out in Virginia Beach. So I didn't, I didn't know if you knew that, you even knew that was there. It's actually funny. There's some really funny videos about it <laughs> online. Um, the company is now bankrupt, but I had <laughs> co-founded that with like four other people back in 2013. And, uh, you know, I basically was reading about Bitcoin and I went into the incubator where I had space and I told my mentor, you know, Tom Flake, I was like, Hey, you know anything about Bitcoin? He's like, eh, I've seen like a headline here or there. I don't, I don't know. Tell, tell me about it. So I told him about it. And then, you know, he got a couple of guys together. We all met and I ended up buying like the first Bitcoin miner for this company. I ended up writing some of the earliest code for the company. And I sort of didn't really have much to do with it materially anyway, past 2015. But in 2017, when Bitcoin was going really crazy, they managed to raise and all together like $65 million of investment. And that was sort of like cash and Bitcoin miners and all sorts of stuff from SBI holding in Japan. And so after this was all sort of this, this sort of happened after the Kickstarter, they did this big raise and I was like, Hey, great. This company I co-founded and put some, you know, I have some early sweat equity in this company is like taken off. I'll just, you know, I'll just wait a little while and I'll hope maybe I'll be able to use the money from this company to build a game. Um, and then I, I started my own uh, crypto startup called CoinPuck that was going to be like an AI trading platform. And, um, I sort of had the idea in my mind that, well, I could build this really fast, the market's really hot. I built this product in a couple of months and you know, we started getting some interest on, on that. And you know, lo and behold, the Bitcoin market crashed and um, 
you know, it just, it was no longer, it was like, okay, this is, that, this is not going to work. And um, because we're still going for a while, but eventually, they, now they didn't really get caught up in the crash of Bitcoin so much. They'd set up the company so that it wasn't really susceptible to it. But somebody in the company made a mistake um, and they ended up having, you know, a creditor and basically it, it ended up in the hands of a judge who decided, listen, you got to close up and, and liquidate to pay off this person. So. It's a uh, yeah, really unfortunate um, you know set of circumstances because this company was doing you know was doing something pretty amazing, and uh, so that that folded up and that um, sort of bring, brought me all the way back to looking at the one product that I had been working on for a long time, which was uh, which was Stream SDK that we we were talking about because I had been working on that product for you know I've been working on that for like eight years, sort of in the background, not really. Um, you know, not, it wasn't, I never thought it was like a scalable thing. And so I always sort of kept it, it was a unity asset. I always kind of kept it on the store, kept it going. It was always making me a little bit of money, um, you know, some months better than others. And um, during Pixel Fest, like when we first met, Pixel Fest 2018, I actually had the product, I'd gone from in 2013 selling this thing for like 50 bucks a license to 2018, I was selling it for 2,500 a license. And I, yeah, it was, it was crazy. So uh, I had customers at Microsoft that were using it, customers at Charter Communications. There was a, a, a shower main nameless 3D modeling company that was using it. Um, so it's pretty neat uh, to, to sort of get there. And that at that point I, I thought, well, maybe this product is, is potentially scalable um, and could sort of earn some revenue to the point where you know, maybe I can build this up. You know, I've been building it up over the course of eight years. Maybe I could build this up and and spin it off, and then maybe that would be the capital. But sort of the alternative version of that is, well, you know, forget about building Swapfire two to this. You know, I've got this vision in my head of what it should be. Sort of forget about building that, and maybe just build a two D Swapfire, which is going to be, you know, lower level of intensity as far as resources are, are needed. Um, it, it'd be something that would be easier to execute anyway. I don't know how the fans would feel about that, but certainly it seems like the game could be fun, and certainly it seems like it could be doable on a smaller budget than what I have in my head as far as what Swampfire 2 is supposed to be. So. True. I, I wonder if you can go on Facebook and Twitter and wherever else and ask people if they'd be interested in 2D, and that way if everyone's like, nah, boo, if, if you get booed instantaneously, then you know maybe don't pursue it, but I wonder if you can gauge based on that. Do you also, quick question, but I, I am astonished by the amount of projects you've worked on over the year, years and the, I don't know, just the, yeah, the amount of different things that you've built. When you, when you come up with these ideas and you start coding and you want to get a new product in the, into people's hands, do you have people that work on all of like the, the marketing and all this kind of stuff for you? Or are you just good at selling your stuff? Because it, it just sounds like like, like, man, you you know how to sell it or something. I don't know. You, you've got something magic going on. Man, there. I appreciate that, man. Whoa, yeah. whoa. <laughs> You're, like, interviewing me here. This is great. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. I, well, I, I listen to, your, I listen to the, uh, the Pixel Fest podcast and stuff like that, but like you said, besides talking to you briefly at Pixel Fest and listening to the podcasts, I don't know, you know, that much about everything that you've done, so. Yeah, it, uh, so I would say during, it depends on, what projects and what time period. So as Pixel Fest was ramping up between 2015 and 2018, Henry Meredith was working with me. And so he did a lot of like the Pixel Fest branding and stuff like that. Uh -huh. um, so I've definitely got to give him credit for, you know, even the, the Pixel Fest logo that's here. He did that, the little pixel character that we use. He, he was the one who actually did that pixel art for our first game jam. And I'm still using that little character. Um, so, but it, it, uh, yeah, a lot of the marketing also, yes, I just do it. Um, so the, and when we worked together, it, I, I was able to sort of set the direction of it. And then Henry, he is a very patient person and he would go and spend the time to try to, I think, take, take it up a notch as far as the, the level yeah. of polish would go. So I would sort of like rough something out and throw it out. And then he would be like, you know, let me take a look at that. And then he'd spend a little bit more time on it, and he, you know, he'd sort of tinker in the background on it to sort of take it up to this next level. Um, a lot of the stuff, though, over the years, I've just done by myself. Um, 
I'm trying to think. It really depends on which product. Vince White, though, is another person who I work with who he'll he'll take he can take what I'm thinking, sort of the yeah. direction I want to go with it, and then he can scale that up. So when you look at like the comic book for Swapfire, for example, of course he's the one who made that look, you know, the way that it looks. And he, I I would do some graphics and be like, well, what about this? And then again, he would sort of be like, all right, let me take a look at that, <laughs> and then go and and sort of polish it up. Um, some of the stuff though, I just had luck on my own doing the, the marketing. Um, yeah. I would say usually it, it was better, the quality would be better if I would if I could get something out there and get it into the hands of somebody else who would then, who could sort of see where I was trying to go with it and then they'd be like, you know, they could sort of take it to this next level that, um, yeah. I'm, yeah, I think I'm sort of obsessed with direction and, um, and magnitude, the, sort of the magnitude of the execution is something that I have, I very much appreciate, but I don't know. I don't know if that's really my forte, though. Um, being able to see the direction for whatever for whatever reason seems to be that seems to be very meaningful to me and something that I look look towards. I look at you know you look out into the world and there's like an infinite sea of you know paths that you could take, and and for some reason paths uh, efficient paths in the noise tend to jump out at me. I don't know why. Interesting, yeah, and, and I see what you're saying. It's like the, the longer you do this kind of stuff, uh, the better you can talk about it. You know, like the you can speak about it with more authority, which will get other people on board. And the more people you get on board, it's like you've built out this whole like Rolodex of like different developers and different people of different talents that you can work with on different projects. That's cool. It's like you. It seems like you've got a got an awesome thing going. Well, I appreciate you saying that, Matt. <laughs> um, man, now. Did you uh, did you watch the the pixel cast from last week? The devs meet up at uh, Guy Fieri's. No, I'm two I'm two episodes behind, I believe. Okay. I yeah, I've been listening to him while I while I work out, but I only work out for fifteen minutes each day, so I got to listen in chunks. <laughs> I gotcha. Nice, nice. Yeah, it was a really fun meetup. Um, I think you'll I think hopefully you'll enjoy that one. I know that you're uh, you've been sort of on the fence about maybe coming out to one or maybe not. that goes with these things I, I admittedly have like the most horrible case of like social anxiety where usually usually when I get out to a space I'm like I'm totally fine and I can talk to people kind of like you and I are here and you know I, I did Pixel Fest and I was fine talking to random people there but it's like the idea of going and sitting in an environment full of strangers like for some reason my, my brain always blocks me from getting out the door and actually going to do it Right. When I go do it, it's fun, but it's getting to that point that's hard. Yes, yes. You know, I um, throughout I think I have various times where that happens also, and and it's it's very interesting um, how your energies work. You know, there's sometimes that I just want to stay in my office and work, and you know, not not go out, not not see people, and then yeah. I I. I tend to be able to. I tend to go back and forth both ways because I'll get eventually I'll get bored of being alone, and yeah, yeah. at the same time, if I start going out too much, I'll eventually it'll drain me. Eventually, where I'll be like, oh my gosh, I need to go recharge. I'm I'm sort of bleeding energy to uh, be around people, which I think means that maybe I'm actually an introvert. But I, I, I for some reason seem to have a need for both both of these interactions. Um, certainly being alone I think is a little bit more charging for me but then yeah. it, I do run into uh, you know you can run into boredom or depression or whatever being just by yourself you know yeah you got a little bit of that hybrid in you the introvert tendencies with the, the little bit of extrovert in you when I was when I was going to college and when I was in my 20s I was a social butterfly um for whatever reason, and I didn't get the uh, the horrible social anxiety stuff for some reason until I got into my 30s. I don't know if it's like the, the chemistry in your body changes as you get older, but mm -hmm. it was like once I hit, I don't know, 31 or 2 or something like that, it got it got bad. Right. Were you spending more time inside at that point, though, where you're just kind of working alone? You know, one thing that it might be is when I, so when I, I forget how old I was when my wife and I got married. Maybe I was... 30 or 31 or something like that and I and I think when I got married you know like like my wife is my my best friend and we hang out every day and I just we just really enjoy each other's companies um 
each other's company, and I, I wonder if it was just that feeling of like I don't I don't need anybody else. I don't need to make new friends or, or right. anything like that. Which I know is not like a healthy way to live, but I wonder if subconsciously that's what it was. I'm not sure. That is pretty cool though to have that feeling though. Um, I could identify with that in in my early 30s as well, before yeah. I had kids, and it was just my <laughs> wife and I. We would spend we would kind of do a similar thing where you just spend a ton of time together. Uh, not go out. We just hang out in you know in our apartment or you know whatever, and just you know be with each other. Um, I would say uh, at that point, I'm trying to remember. We did uh, you know we did a decent amount of going out. We used to live over off of Cali, so I don't know where y'all are living, but we would. So we would you know the the big trip would be to walk out from the apartment and walk to Kelly's. And you know, go get like a chicken yeah, sandwich yeah. or a drink or whatever. That was like right, the big, right. the big night out. Where are you, where are you all located? That sounds cool. We are on a, we're on Brambleton. We're like right between Ghent and downtown. So we're pretty, oh. we're centrally located. We're at um, I'm trying to think of our, our cross street here. We're at Brambleton and um, I don't know. I'm trying to think. <laughs> but yeah, between Ghent and downtown is a nice place to be because then you can you can yeah. walk over to Freemason, or you can or you can go walk to Ghent, which is really cool. Are you guys using the Tide? The what? Oh, the Tide? Yeah. No, here's the thing with the Tide for us, right? Is because there there's a stop that's like a, a block away from us, but in one direction it just takes you to the hospital, and then like in the other direction it'll take you to the to the mall and like the the other stop that's really close to the mall downtown. Yep. We're like, eh, we always just end up walking. You just so walk there, yeah. Yeah. I've, uh, yeah, we're I've, take the tide to the end. <laughs> I, the furthest I took it was to the Tides baseball stadium. And oh, I think, cool. yeah, we've done that. I think I took my kids down there. So I've written it only as a novelty, but I was thinking if I lived where you are, would I jump on it to go to like city center instead of walking there? Um, mm. I don't know if it's actually a shorter, like time wise. But you know, if it was cold or something, I could see like, oh, let's just hop on it at. Um, is the stop that's closest to you the one that is at uh, da, 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 the Y right there? Yeah, that one. Okay. I live right right across the street from there. Oh, awesome, awesome. Yeah, I love yeah. that that whole area. You guys walk over to like the pagoda and stuff like that. All the time when we walk our dog. Yeah. yeah that man. That is such a beautiful area. That is a, that is a great spot. Um, yeah, man, just going back to the social anxiety thing, I, I feel like at that time period was probably, I'm trying to think when it was, I do remember a time period where I was working on indie games, and I was inside all the time, and I did get to the point where going out was a stressor. Like, it was, it's, I started to become uh, slightly fearful, I guess, for some reason, I don't know why. It seemed to be that sort of like the maximum amount of I'm trying to think how to describe it I just didn't have to deal with it you know and it did become a thing where oh now I have to deal with this and something I'm not used to dealing with and yeah and for some reason it was uh, I didn't want to go out either <laughs> I kind of remember having a, a period of time like that after this with you, next time you guys are, especially like super close to me, next time you guys go to Circuit Social or Pixels or something like that, yeah, I probably have no reason not to go meet up Dude, and say hi. <laughs> come on out, man. I think it would be awesome. I think, uh, I, I feel like this game, especially, uh, I'd love to, I, I, I hope people go get it, and I'm gonna, I'll share it with people, um, but looking at this game, I do feel like this is an inspirational game for people that are local, because, you know, you've, you've, gone and you've made the game it's clearly made with love it's made for the most part i think right here in norfolk right i can't remember when you moved here i don't know if you started working on it when you're in la or if you pretty much developed this thing right here in norfolk uh, yeah yeah at least half of development was do done here at least half if not a little bit more than half yeah yeah because i mean you were here october 2018 and the game had what six months into it at that point so um yeah. you know here's this game developed right here in norfolk you know, and you got it up on Steam. You you know you shipped the game. It's incredibly polished, and it's to the point where a publisher approached you. Yes, they found you through your Twitch stream or whatever. Who cares how they found you? They thought enough of the work that you were doing that they want to put this on PS4, Xbox, and Switch, right? Yeah. So I mean, that's you. Um, this is I think a a great and wonderful success story. And also, 
one thing that's I think really important is that it's a I think for an indie game and the you know again going back to 2D so I have always liked 3D games uh, and and even developing them even developing a 3D game for for some reason to me always seemed more intuitive than developing a 2D game but of course I've read all the articles and all the advice over the years was listen if you're an indie don't do a 3D game because it's it's so much more complicated and you really don't have the magnitude or the bandwidth to do it right. You know, that's, I think that's sort of the general advice. And um, I've made a lot of 3D games and some of them have been successful, but I, at this point, I love the idea of the 2D game and I've made a couple of them now. I had never made a lot of 2D games in the past. I think the first one that I really did was the Kishibashi game. And it did, it came out, it came out really, much nicer like on, on uh, in terms of polish now Vince White was on board with that game so he's uh, you know a really good artist and he was able to help take that polish level up but also it just seemed that 2D it, it at the end of the day it you know you are missing that extra dimension and that does give you more bandwidth to focus on the little details and things like that you know what I mean you're not you're not you're not sort of fighting this technical struggle and um, even though I, I I think it's slightly less intuitive because you know when you're dealing with the real world it's three dimensional and you sort of think in 3D and so when you go to develop a 3D game to me working in a 3D editor was always like kind of going in my backyard and putting something together you know um, yeah, yeah. but anyway I do though I, I now I sort of subscribe I think now to the idea that a 2D game is a great way to go if you have limited resources and you want to make something that is polished and you know you can put that level of detail like you have here with RoboZaro um, and I know there are a number of other people in the community that are working on 2D games and so um, I just feel like they need to see this thing you know talk to you and sort of get inside the mind of somebody who's who's done this um, and especially for a first game because that's that's another thing if um, you know if somebody they can sort of attribute you know your experience to like oh well I I don't have that level of experience or whatever so I'm not going to be able to do it but everybody's got a first game that they do where they didn't know anything yes, when they made it you know what I mean so I, I think it's um, it's also I think it's good motivation to be able to be like that one degree of separation from somebody like hey like Matt had not made a game <laughs> and then he decided to put his time and effort into this game develop this really cool thing and you know Maybe he's not, you know, a gazillionaire off of the Steam release of that game, but he is going to go that next step and get this game on the consoles. And you know what? That's going to—it's one step further, and hopefully that'll be enough to get you to a third step and a fourth step. And you know, you just—you take a little seed and you plant it, and you just water it, and you know, give it sunlight and let it grow little by little by little. And uh, this is, I, I, to me, I think this is a project that it's, it seems like you could do that with. So, awesome! Thank okay. you. Yeah. I think people have, to, people have to see this, and then people people got to talk. You got to come out to the next meetup. When you watch that meetup, you'll see, man. We have so much fun at the. Uh, All right, I'll, I'll come we, out. I'll we have so much fun at the meetups. <laughs> you, you 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 sold me. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. Um, so let's see here. We are we're up at an hour and three minutes, and this is cool because I've never talked to Matt this long. I think I probably talked to Matt for about three minutes at Pixel Fest 2018. And um, I, I'm glad that you messaged me, though, and and, uh, and I'm gl so glad that you got this game. Is there anything else that's on your mind tonight? No, not really. I mean, like you said, I, I didn't mean to uh, to sound like I was trying to interview you earlier. I hope it didn't <laughs> I, I got an interview. Just, uh... <laughs> no, that was you know what? I was that was uh, you made me feel good. You made me feel good. Hmm. <laughs> yeah. so To like a thousand, talked about a thousand times, so the people are gonna listen to this and be like, ah, we are, we already heard him tell this story. We already, we've already heard him talk about these games a hundred times. Hopefully, I didn't uh, accidentally bore everybody with that. Nah, I think you got into some new territory. I, I did start wanting to interview more people because I was just doing the show by myself at first, and um, you know, I, I was like, okay, people are really gonna get bored. I, I feel comfortable enough to start interviewing people. And that's going to make the show, you know, it's going to be better. You're going to get more opinions, more diverse backgrounds and stuff. And it's not just like, you know, the, uh, the Jeremy hour every, every week. So I think that's, that's better. And it's, and it, 
reaching out and finding new people and new stories to inspire other people, I think now is what I think the show is really more about. And I'm, uh, and I want to get better at um, listening and like speaking less. I think that's a big thing for me. Um, you know, so I'm trying. I'm trying to work on that. And when I watch the show, I realize how much I talk and how much I don't listen. So I'm like, man, I need to go ahead and listen, need to listen a little bit better, talk a little bit less. This is going to be a challenge for me. <laughs> you've, you've got a lot of experience. You have a lot of opinions. You, you have a lot to say about the, uh, the things that you've done and what's worked and what hasn't worked and stuff like that. So I, I think it just comes with the territory. Yeah, you're, you're right. You'll, if, if that's your goal, you'll, you'll get better at it for sure. But I thought it was good. Thanks. I really appreciate that, Matt. So, um... Yeah, uh, let's see. So, final words? Final words? Thanks for thanks for having me on. And yeah, like, like you were saying, I will uh, I'll come out to a meetup. Uh, <laughs> it'll be cool to talk to people. I, I guess ultimately when I messaged you and I said, hey, we should talk about game dev, and I, and I made this game and stuff like that, in the, in the back of my mind, you're right. I, sometimes I, I want to be the, the poster child for telling people who are thinking about making a game or just getting into game development like if you if you really just like keep at it you you can do it and you can take it anywhere this game wasn't the quality that it is like overnight i put out crummy builds of it that people made fun of and you know and, and stuff like that before getting to this point you just have to you have to stick with it you have to let people play it um and you have to keep iterating on it. That, those are like the, the three key things, I think. It's just, just don't give up, and eventually you will make something that you're proud of. That is that is awesome. Well, you should be proud of this game. It, it, it drips, I swear, with love. When I was in that opening scene, I was really blown away. And so you did it, and I, I just hope you can share the story with everybody else and that they can meet you, play the game firsthand and everything like that. So... Um, I, you, you've grown through your love of games and you know sort of with that everybody I do want to bid you a good evening let's all keep growing through love of games and yeah. we will talk to you soon good night alright sounds good I'll see you guys soon thank you for having me on Jeremy I, I appreciate it absolutely have a good night Matt bye alright you too take care